So we will begin with the preliminary prayers. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. In dependent origination, there is no seizing, no rising, no annihilation, no permanence. No coming, no going, no separateness, and no sameness. I prostrate to the consummate Buddha, the supreme among all teachers, the one who taught this peace, which is freed of elaborations. I prostrate to the mothers of the hearers, the bodhisattvas and the Buddhas, which through the knowledge of all lead hearers seeking pacification to complete peace, which through the knowledge of paths causes those helping my greatest to achieve the aims of the world and through the possession of which help subdue is expound a variety of teachings. The one who is transformed into the reliable guide motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher, Sugatha, and protector, to you I make prostrations. The one who has eliminated the web of conceptualizations and is endowed with the divine bodies of the vast and the profound, who eternally shines forth the noble, the forever noble light rays, to you, the Buddha, I make prostrations. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind of full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. The Dependent Origination Mantra, Om Ye Dharma He Tu Prabhava, He Tum Tisham Tathagato Hyabhadat, Tisham Chayo Nirodha, Evam Vadi Mahashramana Ye Swaha. Om Ye Dharma He Tu Prabhava, He Tum Tisham Tathagato Hyabhadat, all phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. The, the cessation of the causes as well is taught by the great seer. Profound, peaceful, elaboration-free, clear light and non-composite. Such is a nectar-like dharma I have discovered. Finding no one to fathom this teaching, in silence, I will retire into the woods. Beyond utterance, thought, and expression is the perfection of wisdom, which is unborn, unseized, and has the nature of space. It is the object of apprehension of self-realized wisdom. To you, the mother of the Buddhas of the three times, I pay ob obeisance. All composite things are impermanent. All contaminate things are of the nature of suffering. All phenomena are of the nature of emptiness and selflessness. Transcending sorrow is peace. The Guru is the Buddha. The Guru is the Dharma. Likewise, the Guru is the Sangha. The Guru is the source of everything wholesome. I go for refuge in the Guru. By the sound of the vibrant drum of Dharma, you liberate all beings of miseries. I beseech you to kindly remain and give teachings until the end of the expanse of billions of eons. The Buddha does not wash the negativities of beings, nor does he remove their miseries by his hands. His spiritual realizations are not transferred to them. It is by the teaching, but it is by the it is by teaching the truth of suchness that beings are liberated. With folded hands, I beseech the Buddhas of all directions to shine the light of Dharma for all bewildered in misery's gloom. If you're attached to this life, you are not a spiritual practitioner. If you're attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you're attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there's, there is grasping, you do not have the view. Praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. 
to the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugatha, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct. Sugatha, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan. I make prostrate, I prostrate, make offerings and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct. Sugatha, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendental destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. When, O supreme among humans, you were born on this earth, you paced out seven strides, then said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise then, I prostrate. With pure bodies from supre form supremely pure, wisdom ocean like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, winner of the best, Lord, to you I prostrate. With the supreme signs, face like a spotless moon, color like gold, to you I prostrate. Dust free like you, the three worlds are not, incomparable wise one, to you I prostrate. The savior having great compassion, the founder having all understanding, the field of merit with qualities like a vast ocean, to you, the Tathagata, I prostrate. The purity that, pre that frees one from attachment, the virtue that frees one from the lower realms, the one path, the sublime pure reality, to the dharma that pacifies, I prostrate. Those who are liberated and also show the path to liberation, the holy field qualified with realizations, who are devoted to the moral precepts, to you, the Sangha, I prostrate. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions, perform only perfect virtuous actions. Subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. A star, a visual aberration, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, a drop of dew or a bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud, see condition things as such. Through these merits, may sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing. Subdue the foe of faults and be delivered from, ocean, from samsara's oceans, perturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. The Sutra Mantra. Tayatha om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha. Tayatha om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha. Tayatha om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha. Tayatha om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha. Tayatha om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha. Tayatha om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha. And then some aspirational verses. I go for refuge to the triple gem. I confess the negativities individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings. I hold the precious Buddhahood in my heart. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Sangha. I generate the mind of Bodhicitta to, resolu to resolutely accomplish the aims of others and myself. Having generated the mind of supreme enlightenment, Bodhicitta, I invite all sentient beings to be my guests and shall engage in the delightful and excellent practices of full enlightenment. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge to the triple gem. I confess the negativities individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings. I hold the precious Buddhahood in my heart. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha Dharma and the Supreme Sangha. I generate the mind of Bodhicitta to resolutely accomplish the aims of others and myself. Having generated the mind of supreme enlightenment, Bodhicitta, I invite all sentient beings to be my guests and shall engage in the delightful and excellent practices of full enlightenment. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge to the triple gem. I confess the negativities individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings. I hold the precious Buddhahood in my heart. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Sangha. I generate the mind of Bodhicitta to resolutely accomplish the aims of others and myself. Having generated the mind of supreme enlightenment, Bodhicitta, I invite all sentient beings to be my guests and shall engage in the delightful and excellent practices of full enlightenment. 
May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, please pay heed to me. Just as the previous Buddhas having generated have generated the mind of Bodhicitta, and just as they success, successively dwelt in the Bodhisattva practices, likewise for the benefit of all sentient beings, I will generate the mind of Bodhicitta. And likewise shall I too successively train in the Bodhisattva practices. Gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, please pay heed to me. Just as the previous Buddhas have generated the mind of Bodhicitta, and just as they successively dwelt in the Bodhisattva practices, Likewise, for the benefit of all sentient beings, I will generate the mind of Bodhicitta, and likewise shall I too successively train in the Bodhisattva practices. Gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, please pay heed to me. Just as the previous Buddhas have generated the mind of Bodhicitta, and just as they successively dwelt in the Bodhisattva practices, likewise, for the benefit of all sentient beings, I will generate the mind of Bodhicitta, and likewise shall I too successively successively train in the bodhisattva practices. Uh, thank you, Sne. And uh, Sheila, thank you. And we have Abilardo. Okay. So nice to all of, uh, meet all of you. Thank you. And um, um so, sorry, Geshila, Jenny, um, can you stop screen sharing? Sorry about that, Geshila. Okay, no problem. Uh thank you. Um okay, so the um First of all, I welcome you all to this, the, the teaching on commentary on the awakening mind, how composed by Arun Nagarjuna at the request of the Shantideva Buddhist Center at PMT in New York. And um, just for just the background information about this text, commentary by commentary on the awakening mind or Bodhicitta. Uh, this is actually the composition, like uh, the a form of commentary on a verse from Shri Gurasamaja Tantra, root tantra of Shri Gurasamaja. And then the uh, one thing that we need to know as to the difference between the tantra and sutra is that the um, Say so first of all, we is very important for us to get away from the uh, miscon the misconceptions of what tantra is. Uh, this is very important, and the first of all, what we need to keep in mind is that the tantra is a very sophisticated practice, and in the first place, it is referred to as the um, uh, the the secret mantrayana secret, which means that the, it should be maintained confidential for the reason that very sophisticated practices, the oftentimes people, they don't have the right mindset. They don't have the, uh, the, the proper say, the ability to understand it and then uh, can actually damage themselves. For example, like the medicines, all the medicines we see that they, it bears a label we said, that keep out of keep out of reach of children. It doesn't it doesn't mean that these medicines are something very esoteric. It's because that these are very helpful, but the children they don't know as to how much to to take, that the dose amount of the dose they don't have that capacity, and then the not only children even the elders also, for example like sleeping pills. <coughs> Um, oftentimes they take more than the they took more than the dose prescribed by the the doctors, saying that okay now it is not effective, I cannot sleep even with the sleeping pills, and they take more and then they uh, feel overdose. It, it's what happens oftentimes. So with this in mind, and this is one thing that we need to keep in mind, and particularly um, the the uh, here, I see that the people from Shanti Deva Center. 
um, no doubt you have the good exposure to the very precise appropriate dharma. And I see that, in fact, the people who are more closely associated with the very standard teachers, their understanding of dharma becomes naturally very good. And um, the, for example, like say, I have my friend here, Jeffrey and Laurie, both of them who have been very close, closely associated, who have been closely associated with uh, the, the most venerable Kensu Rinpoche. And uh, the, um, so there, even I had the owner, also had the owner of the receiving teachings from Kensu Rinpoche, Kensu Geshe Wanda Rinpoche. And the because that two of them are very closely associated, and in fact two of them are very meritorious that they had the honor of the serving uh, the most the the venerable Kinsur Bashem in his last days. That's amazing. So the what I'm saying is that these people who are with the very standard teachers, naturally the outlook of the, the dharma, be it sutra, tantra. It becomes very standard, very authentic. Whereas when we are not really associated with the very standard teachers, they read books, they can end up into all form, forms of. And then even you know, say that even if you are associated with some teacher, you always you dig too many wells. People dig too many wells, and then they buy. They don't really feel attached to any particular, you know, standard teacher because of which they end up their mind so confused. This is usually what happens. So therefore, they um, I say one thing that I like to, of course, I'm not entitled to, you know, share many things about the Tantra, and it's until the, the, the audience, they are prepared with all the prerequisites intact. Um, the, but there are a few points which, if I, if I may share with you, is that one thing is that it's all about finally uh, the awakening of your Buddha nature. Fun. First, we begin by the, the basic question, what do you want? This is from where we, we need to, to begin. Um, the say, what do you want? So say the say sometimes uh, people who uh, they uh, bring their friends to a Tibet house and then, then they say, okay, so you must come to Tibet house here. And there are so many teachings happening. I said that don't make things boring. So we don't know what the inclination of the other person is. So we, I just say that come to Tibet house, not for teachings, but for a cup of tea. Because this is the, you know, we don't know what the, the other person is actually seeking. And we cannot really bulldoze somebody to study Dharma and so forth. The point is that the, it must happen with the, say, the, the unfolding, gradual unfolding of the, the, the greater and greater meaning of one's life. And with this in mind, um, the, the people, they first, they go for the external factors. I want happiness. I want good, they say, the, the reputation in the community, good salary, good place to stay, good health, insurance. This is one thing. They, 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 these should not be neglected, number one. Then number two, that you once you have these things, then still something is missing. That with these things intact, still it doesn't guarantee that I'm happy. There's something lacking. Some people who, have, who are billionaires, but essentially extremely, extremely unhappy which means that they don't get what they are looking for, initially thinking that it's all coming from outside. And now you see that you have everything, but the conventional world says that this is everything. You have that, still you're not happy. So then you start to look for, look inwardly. Look inwardly, then you come to know that the real source of happiness is within you. That is known as Buddha nature. The seed of, seed of awakening. And this Buddha nature, when it's because of Buddha nature, Buddha, Buddha doesn't mean Buddhism. Don't forget, let's not forget it. It doesn't mean Buddhism. The Buddha Shakyamuni, who is revered as the founder of the Buddhism, uh, the, this Buddha nature existed way before the Buddha Shakyamuni was born on the planet Earth. So, and that the, the Buddha, Buddha is awakening, awakening, perfection. And this seed of perfection 
existed not necessarily within the Buddhist. It existed within everyone. It is exists within everyone. All the sentient beings, not only human beings, not only males, not only females, everyone, not only human beings, animals, insects, hungry ghosts, god and goddesses, spirits, everyone has the Buddha nature. Zero perfections are within everyone. It's for this reason that the Buddha made it very clear that everyone is equal. There's no one who is higher, lower. Everybody is equally important. So therefore, the Buddha very strongly stood against uh, any form of discrimination uh, during his, while he was alive. So he fought against gender discrimination. He fought against racial discrimination, caste, and so forth. So it's all because that, that the, he, was ex, he was fully convinced that there is what is known as the seed of perfection, technically referred to as the Buddha nature, or Tathagata Garma, within the minds of all sentient beings. This is the one thing that we need to know. Once you know that externally, it doesn't guarantee that you get a maximum happiness, but you do have the, the seeds of the maximum happiness, infinite happiness, or the fearlessness. If there is a case, and of course, the first thing is that how do you know that we all have this seed of perfection? This is one thing that we have to study. We don't, we will never get to understand it through blind faith. It must come to us through proper studies. And the, the, the best book, one book that I would suggest is by Arunigarjuna, known as the, on the Dharma Dadu Stava, in praise of Dharma Dadu. That text must be studied, and then you will get a deeper conviction in the fact that we, I do have the seed of perfection within me. There's no reason why I should, simply because the world is turning against me, doesn't mean that I should go down that the saying, what the world is, that's a different story. But I have the seed of perfection within me. Everybody has the seed of perfection. Seeing the seed of perfection within you, you don't feel hopeless. Seeing the perfection, seed of perfection within others, you feel that you respect everybody else equally. So the next question is that after getting conviction in this, that I do have, what I'm seeking is I'm seeking fearlessness and infinite happiness, you know? In short, we are seeking fearlessness, infinite happiness. And to really seek it, it makes sense only if you have the capacity to, to get it. Do you have the potential to get it? Yes, of the both energy with me. This is the next thing that we need to be convinced. And that it is actually within me, number two. Once you know this, why it is not visible at the moment, why I'm not experiencing it at the moment, it's because it must be obscured. It's not, it, it must be veiled by some obscurations. That is number three. And what are these What are these veils which obscure this amazing and precious Buddha energy within us? What veils these, the, the, uh, this potential? This next question. So for that, then we talk about the two obscurations afflictive obscurations and the cognitive obscurations. And since here, I see that most of you, are the your, your face is familiar to me. So therefore, they, I will not really go too, too detail into this, what constitutes afflictive obscurations, what constitutes cognitive obscurations. And given that many of you are already familiar with all these concepts, I may go a little deeper rather than going into details. Um, so we see that the that this incredibly precious, the treasure of the ultimate happiness within us, within each, each one of us, is being veiled by the mental defilements known as afflictive obscurations, cognitive obscurations. And how do you demarcate, but how do you distinguish the two? Is on the basis of the, the function of a mind. For example, I like say my hand, my hand, say it can carry you know, my other hand, that's nice. But the, I, I can be very aggressive also. It's the same hand, but be, can behave in a different ways. So like what's the same mind, same mind, when it, it is under the influence of some other factors, it can, it can they say, behave extremely aggressively. So today we see all the world wars happening, all the domestic violence happening, all these problems are happening because the mind goes haywire. It, it becomes out of control through the influence of some other factors. And this is not your true nature. Your true nature is extremely beautiful. Extremely beautiful. 
where it just expands infinitely with universal compassion. And it knows every phenomenon in great detail in, this, in, the, in their most profound state. In other words, it has a perfect knowledge, the perfect wisdom, the perfect love or universal compassion and a perfect power. So while these are the characteristics or the traits of a mind, but we don't display this because that the, the, these qualities or traits are being obscured by some defilements. So this, this defilements is nothing like the external mud coming on a mind. It's simply how the mind behaves. So the mind behaves on the basis of what is known as the cognitive, the, the cognitive thought process. Mind behaves dictated by the cognitive thought process. And then the mind, the, the cognitively speaking, cognitively speaking, when the mind, the say the um the the object that the mind interacts with to cognitively uh, the they handle the object, when the, the object is they say they apprehend it mistakenly, erroneously, or in a very narrow scope, very narrow, and that to distort it, then the mind behaves mind behaves in a very different way, very aggressively, and very can at times can become very cunning also. So it's purely the cognitive, I say the the aspect of the mind, which determines how your mind behaves. And so it is on this basis that a mind, we see that it, the, it can be the same mind can be seen in two different ways. One, the cognitive side of the mind, and the other, the affective side of the mind, affective and the cognitive. Meaning that, for example, let's say that I sit here and then they say somebody who really, you know, is being so kind, nice to me, comes by, then how I behave, there's a glow on my face coming, my mind feels at ease. And somebody who dislikes me comes by, then instantly your heart starts to palpitate. Dig, 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 dig. And then the glow stops, glow of your face stops. This is because the person is not doing anything, simply even the person may not be aware of your presence there. person passes by, but they say the, your the physiological changes already happened here within us. So what made these physiology changes? What brought these physiology changes? It's because of the cognitive, you know that that is a person who is a complicated one, who I don't like. So with this, then the, this cognitive aspect of the mind, that affects our physiology. Physiology. And how it affects the physiology is that the, say, the, 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 look at the study of the Buddhist psychology, the mention of the, how the mind, mind works, mind and the mental factors. So with the mental factors, we talk about the, say, five ever-present mental factors. The five mental factors, which are forever present with any primary mind. Where there is a mind, these five functions are there always. These five functions are always there. So what are they? Contact, attention, discrimination, feeling, and intention. These five are there always, always. You're sleeping, you're unconscious state, uh, or you're in a vegetative state, or you're in a very active state of the celebration, and so forth. And the, your mind is behaving in these five. At times, these five are so active, sometimes they are these are less active. Say, when we're in a common state, when we're in a vegetative state, what's going in your mind? We're not too sure. Outside, is, we, we cannot be too sure. Because we, physically, phys simply because on the basis of the physiological, the reactions of the person, and then the, say, the how the body manifestations cannot really predict what is going inside the person's mind. Simply because the physically, physiology of the person is has slowed down, doesn't mean that the mind is really slowed down. We never know. But of course, it is not as gross as um, when you are in a fully uh, waking state. So with this mind, what I'm saying is that, so how the mind behaves are so aggressive, so gentle, so kind, enlightened, unenlightened, devilish, is all decided by these five ever-present mental factors. Let me repeat it. Contact, attention, discrimination, feeling, 
and the intention. So say, what happens when somebody who, the, who you dislike passes by? What happens? And then the, the person says something nasty to you. What happens? You, your mind feels a tightness. Your body feels a tightness, heaviness, tightness. And then the, say, your body also becomes really, you know, say the, uh, the, the rigid. Um, and then you feel suffocated. So whether someone who really takes care of you and who you missed the last five years, 10 years because of the, let's say the, the last five years because of COVID, and suddenly the person passes by, gave you a surprise visit and the mind simply expands. There's so much joy in the end. What is happening? It's purely that your mind comes to sense that this is a person who I like, who, who I love. So this cognitive activity, this cognitive activity, it is, say, the number one, come, came in contact with the person who you love. Then you pay attention, is that this person? Is that the person who I love? Then the discrimination says, yes. Yes, this is the one. Discrimination says, yes. So that is the full, full form of the cognitive activity of your mind. Yes, this is the person who... They who who takes care of me for all these many years, the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. This is a person, you know, the cognitive active the mind, which just cognitively discerns that this is a person. Then the feeling, the next feeling, the feeling is because that this is they is something you are in favor of, the feeling is extremely pleasant. You feel so pleasant feeling. So this pleasant feeling. Uh, you like the pleasant feeling or not? You like the pleasant feeling. So this pleasant feeling, if you like the pleasant feeling, what do you really do? What do you do is that you embrace this pleasant feeling. How to embrace the pleasant feeling? Who triggered? What triggered the pleasant feeling? You will, sus to sustain the pleasant feeling, you try to embrace the trigger of the pleasant feeling. What is the trigger of the pleasant feeling? That person who you love, who passed by you. So you like to do Embrace the person more to keep it close by you so that the pleasant feeling will last longer. So that intention, number five, intention to embrace this person so that the pleasant feeling will last longer. Embrace the person or say they embrace the situation or say for example, your birthday celebration. If you really enjoyed it, then they to embrace, trying to embrace the birthday situation, birthday time. How many hours? Maximum 24 hours. But then you want to make it 24 hours, 48 hours. You know, if there's a possibility to embrace it, keep embracing it 24 hours and just stretch it, right? You try to stretch it, but of course we cannot stretch it more than the, the next day is not your birthday. So, but, but the mind tries to stretch it, stretch, tries to embrace, keep embracing it because this is a pleasant feeling is what we like. And this pleasant feeling, and to sustain that, um, the, the mind, the intention, will try to embrace the trigger of the pleasant feeling. So this is how it works. Now, if the nasty person passes by, or a situation, a situation which you dislike, if the, you happen to meet with the situation, cognitively, you are aware that this is the, 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 uh, the situation which I dislike. And then the with this, the feeling is unpleasant feeling. With unpleasant feeling, you don't like it. Because you don't like it, intention will make to resist. Resist the trigger to push the, the trigger of the unpleasant feeling. So that resistance, if the situation is such that it doesn't go away easily, then your mind will continue to resist, but it fails. Still, still resist it, resist it. And that is known as the stress. And this is reflected in your physiology. Say your blood pressure shoots up, your body heat shoot, they shoots up. So all these are the, the physiological reactions manifested uh, when the metal, the uh, metal factor of the intention, when it starts to resist the stimulus of the unpleasant feeling. So um, the and then if the person doesn't see any proper solution. Then the person will resort to anger. Anger. So therefore, anger is not a sign of anger, aggression. These are not the sign of strength. These are the signs of weakness. Failing to see the solution to the problem, then you resort to anger, aggression, so forth. 
So this is where all the, this is where it's like the same hand behaving very nicely, the same hand being very, very nasty. Same hand. So the same mind can behave so well, the same mind can behave so aggressively. So how it, it behaves very aggressively is the determined by the unpleasant feeling, which in turn determined by the discrimination, which in turn determined by the information uh, that you gathered by the, the, the contact and the attention. And then if the information is so less, information is erroneous, then you are bound to have the discrimination, a wrong discrimination, cognitively erroneous discrimination, because of which the feeling is going to be unpleasant, because of which the intention is going to be resistance. So um, then the, these wars on the global level, it leads to extremely unkind, inhumane um, behavior in some people. But as if the discrimination is extremely rich, profound, so if this doesn't work, that's the end of the way of working because nobody wants, uh, say the or nobody wants, I uh, say the mental disturbance. And when you resort to anger and aggression, mental disturbance also happens to you. Nobody wants it. So therefore, and you have lots of the, the choices. If this doesn't work, that's the choice B. If B doesn't work, that's the choice C. Because uh, you have a vast array of information, deep information. So because of which that the your mind is ever calm, calm. So that is, and particularly if knowledge is full, perfectly deep and perfectly fast. So you have all the solutions. This is when you are known as the omniscient mind, omniscient person, omniscient one. And your mind is omniscient mind. So, so, so there that you feel the ease, total ease. This is known as infinite happiness, universal compassion. Okay, so with this in mind, our job here, after learning all these things, we see that I don't want suffering, I want maximum happiness. And the suffering and happiness, which, which is the suffering which I shun, and the happiness which I embrace, these two are all mental states. And the mental states, when it is under the sway, under the sway of ignorance, Lack of information, erroneous information, and the narrow information, then the consequences that I go through, miseries, resistance, mental intention to resist. Whereas if the information is vast, broad, deep, complete, then uh, the, uh, the feeling is very pleasant feeling. So uh, the intention embraces. So this is if this is how, how it works, then I need to really work on um, the, so to fix my uh, the discrimination, mental factor of discrimination. That is to make my cognitive, uh, the, the cognitive activity of mind, complete, vast, deep, and the, with the, the proper, in properly in the orderly form, not chaotic. So our job is to say the, we build that metal state, the discrimination with the, the vast knowledge and the deep knowledge. So that is known as wisdom. And particularly uh, the one wisdom which makes your knowledge so deep is the wisdom of emptiness. So what is being, being discussed here is the wisdom of emptiness because that finally the root of all our miseries, the root of all the miseries which the Buddha identified when the uh, the the, with the mantra of which Sne uh, recited, Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava, Hetum Te Sham Tathagato Hevatat, Te Sham Chayo Nirota, Evam Vadi Mahashramana Soha. All phenomena arise from causes, and the causes are taught by the Tathagata, the cessation of causes as well as taught by the great seer. So here, that all the problems, the root, the, the causes of the, the problems, the are what the Buddha identified, the Thakata identified. And these causes, which the Buddha identified, are further explained by Arinigarjuna in his text, Mula Madhima Karika, or the Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way, where the Buddha taught that the, say, the season of karma's afflictions is nirvana. Karma's afflictions arise from conceptualization of inappropriate tension. 
which in turn arises from elaboration of self-grasping ignorance. The elaboration ceases through the wisdom of emptiness. So here are the, the four causes identified by Arun Nigarjuna. And the, he commented upon these four, which were actually taught by the Buddha himself. The contaminant karmas, afflictions, which in turn are, they arise from the inappropriate attention, inappropriate attention. And then finally, the self-grasping, elaboration of self-grasping ignorance. So the Buddha identified the ignorance as the root of all the miseries. If you don't want the miseries, then get rid of this ignorance. For example, like in the olden times, like 2,000 years ago, when the global warming was out of question, um, Arctic Circle, all these glaciers, they were seen as extremely stable and strong. And these, on these glaciers, you can stack, you can build you can build houses. You can stack stories and stories, stories. Then after 2000 years, now 2024, with the global warming unexpected in those days, suddenly global warming happened after 2000 years. Now today, as all these glaciers, they start to melt. And then all what you stacked, automatically they crumble down. Likewise, self-grasping ignorance is like the, the glacier on which all these were being st stacked in a private tension afflictions, contaminant commerce, and miseries, they're all stacked up there. So when the glacier melts, the glacier of self-grasping ignorance melts by introducing the counter force, which is the wisdom of emptiness, then automatically all what is being stacked on this, they all crumble down, dissolves. And misery is gone, that is happiness. That is the ultimate peace. So here what we come to learn is that, okay, so with the number one, what, what am I seeking? Number two, what I'm seeking, the potential is actually within me, with the nature. And why it's not manifest? Number three, because it's, it's obscured by mental defilements. Number four, how to remove the mental, mental defilements? Look at the nature of the mental defilements, ignorance. So number five, the remedy, the wisdom of emptiness. So what is this wisdom of emptiness? Number six, this wisdom of emptiness can be seen on two different levels. Two different levels. Um, this wisdom of emptiness can be has to be this this the realization of the emptiness to be done by your mind, the wisdom which is your mind. And this mind we see that is of two kinds. One at the moment which are which is under our control. For example, like at the moment, you want to scream or not scream is in the hand. And if if you scream, it's so weird. So people people think that will happen to you. So that if you know that, so you'll not scream. But in the dream, you have no choice. In the dream, you can stream, anything can happen. In the dream, we don't have any control. So we see that, that our mind, which finally is the place, with the, the place where the wisdom should be born, the wisdom to see the reality should be born to, encounter, to counteract the ignorance, which is like the, the iceberg, the iceberg on which the the, all the miseries stacked up. So to melt this, this wisdom needs to be introduced and this wisdom happens, should should take birth in your own mind. And this mind we see that is of two levels. One, which we have a pretty much some degree of control. For example, in the daytime, okay, I like to lie down, I like to sit up, I like to take a coffee. Oh, no, no, I don't want to have a coffee. I like to have a hot water, whatever. So that's, you have some degree of control. And the moment you fall asleep, you have, all the control is lost, except for when we have, sometimes we have vivid dreams, we call it RAM sleep. RAM sleep, we have some degree of control over mind. Otherwise, the moment we step into the, 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 the dream, we slip into the dream, finish we have lost control. So one mindset where we don't have the control, oh, sorry, and another mindset where we do have the control. So on the, say, wisdom of emptiness on that level where we do have the some control of a mind, that is known as the wisdom of emptiness in the context of the sutra system. Whereas here, whereas here, the text which we are studying now, Bodhicitta Vivarana, in the, say, the commentary on the bodhicitta. So this is 
uh, the actually a commentary, uh, the based on the commentary based on uh, the, the, the tantra text. So there is the, the same wisdom can be born in a mind which which is which is really not in our control, neither not in the control of the people who are not trained like us. Where so the moment you go into sleep, we for example, if I ask you that they who likes to have a dream of and uh, being with a dream of his holiness inviting you for a cup of tea, everybody will say, Yes, yes, I like to have this dream. My next question Who will have this dream tonight? Who likes to have the dream tonight? Everybody will say yes. But who will have the dream tonight? Who will have the dream tonight? Nobody will raise hands. Why not? Why not? It's a very pleasant dream. Why not? Why not are you going to have this dream tonight? Because I don't have the freedom to choose this dream. That's a problem. So, so one mind, there's one set of, them, a set of minds which we don't really have much control unless until we are trained. But there's another set of mind which have some degree of control, the waking state. So the wisdom of wisdom of emptiness employed by the mind, which we which everybody has some degree of control, and that uh, that wisdom of emptiness is in the context of the context of the sutra system, and the wisdom of emptiness employed by the mind, which the ordinary people cannot have access to in terms of the control, that is the wisdom of emptiness in the context of the tantric system. So Tantra Sutra, it does, it's not about, you know, it's not, not about that you can do anything. Like you can drink alcohol and these things, there is Tantra and Sutra. No, you have to, you know, self-denial. You're not supposed to have those. You are not supposed to do that. This is Sutra. This is totally naive. It's totally naive. Say, I say, where is the first in order to, for example, it is like, say, Going crossing crossing the ocean. First, you have to. You yeah, should be. You start from the so from the coast, from the coast. From there, you start. There's only way you cannot jump into the the center. Even if you fly, you have to fly passing by the 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 coast, coastal area, and then you go to the sand the the mid, and then cross. There's only way. Likewise, first we need to control our that the mind. So therefore, I said that I don't, I do, I do not say that we have full control in the waking state. Even in the waking state, we don't have the full control. Because even the waking state, if I said, okay, now how many of you are calm and peaceful now? Abelardo? Yes, we have all very calm. Abelardo, yes. Abelardo, you are calm. Yes, we are all very calm, right? So I tell you that, are you in a waking state or are you in a dream? You're in a waking state. So, then what I said is that, okay, you are calm. You have some control of your mind. Whether you like to think of flower or not think of flower, yes, you have control. And if you think that you have full control, just see somebody who you, uh, I said that, keep the calm, they give yourself cool and calm for the next two hours. And then within five minutes, I send somebody who, who you dislike terribly the person, right, <laughs> to just be with you, just stay there, don't talk anything. And then you feel suffocated, right? Where's your cool? It disappears. We don't have the control. We don't have the control. And then let's say that, say, for example, even if they, for example, like mathematical calculation, if I ask you, if I give you mathematical, simple mathematical plus minus numbers less than five, and that I say it very slowly, Right, you can do it. We can do the medical. medical. Oh, yeah, I know that. And but if I say it very fast, you like you lose you like you you lose track of the calculation, which then you cannot really maneuver your mind as much as you like. It's not really in our hand, even in the waking state. Forget about the when you are in the sleep state. So, sleep state, and then during the coma state. And then finally, dying processes. So in all these the the in all these cases, that since that we are not trained, first we are not trained in the gross mental state. We are not trained in the gross waking state. Then we, there's no way by which we can jump to train ourselves in the uh, the dream state or the subtler states. 
So somebody who is really into Tantra must be so well trained in the Sutra system. Only then you are entitled to go into the Tantra system. Otherwise, some people say, no, we are from Tantra system. This is not relevant to us. This is self-deception. This purely self-deception. It is like saying that we can't even control our mental state in our waking state. We are easily prone to anger, attachment, craving, jealousy, and so forth in the, in the waking state. And then you are talking about controlling my mind in the, the, the dream state and so forth. And at one point, there was the, um, there was a, the, say, the advertisement, dream yoga, dream yoga, anybody can join. This is all about money. This is extremely where everything is so degenerated. Dream yoga. And who's the who is that? The person doesn't know, you know, what's the consequence in the future. It's just for money. Right? Dream yoga means people will come. And then you charge like one session, like one thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, like this. And then the one participant was very honest. He he gave a feedback saying that I attend this dream yoga, the workshop, and the, I tried, as the instruction was given, I tried, and I have no control over the dream. The moment I slip, slipped into the dream, finished, I lost my control. At least, have a good, I, at least have a good sleep. This is the feedback that the person gave. This is very honest feedback. How can we control the subtle mind when we, we, when we cannot manage our gross mind? So just look at, you know, say the, the relationship between the, the parents and the children. So much complex, the complex situations are there. Husband, wife, brothers, sisters, brothers, brothers, sisters, sisters. So much anger of us are happening there. And then on the other hand, we talk about the, the dream yoga. This is the, the paradox. So the point is that the, what I'm saying is that the, the difference between the Sutra and Tantra is where the same, they finally we have to resort to the wisdom of emptiness. And meanwhile, we have to take off the other things also. All composite things are impermanent. All contaminated things are suffering nature. All these teachings the Buddha gave, we should pay heed to these. Only then we can gradually dive or we can gradually be the, say, the proper vessel to understand the Tantra, to work on the, the subtle mind to employ the subtle mind to see emptiness. Okay, so with this in mind, um, the uh, what we said is that the final our, the our mind, our mind, as they say, we have to employ the wisdom of emptiness. And this wisdom of emptiness, when we employ this by using your the gross mind, gross mind meaning the mind which we have more easy access or which we have some degree of control. Um, that is primarily the sutra system, where we employ the wisdom of emptiness, wisdom employs wisdom of emptiness, employing the, the mind, which otherwise we don't have the any control, unless until we have proper training. So that that system is known as the tantra system. This is the main distinction. So having said this, okay, now um, who manages the screen? Sne, who manages Jimmy? Who manages screen? So I like to, and uh, now I want to go to the screen because we have only we have only four sessions. Today's first, tomorrow, and the next Saturday, Sunday. We have only four sessions. Okay, so screen now. Sorry, Ishla, did you want me to share the text? Yes. Okay. Okay, it says, Commentary on Awakening Mind. Um, Bodhicitta Vivarana in Tibetan, Changju Sim Del, Changju Sim Gi Del Ba, by Arendigarjuna. Homage to Glorious Vajra Sattva. Vajra Sattva. Vajra Sattva, of course, is the, the, the sacred name of a deity. 
uh, particularly the in, in association with the purification practices, Vajrasattva. And Vajra has many connotations. The Vajra per se has many connotations. And to give a, a, the simple one, which of course I'm not entitled to explain whatever the, I learned, I'm not entitled to, to share all these things, but to give up the, I know that people who come here, you're all very genuine uh, from the the um, Shanti Deva Center, as well as from the the my the, the friends who attend the my classes, I can see many of you there. So because of which, I may share some of these. Vajra has many connotations. One is that the um, the Vajra in the say on the one hand Vajra, it simply means the indestructible one. Indestructible one. Dorje in Tibetan, it is known as Dorje, indestructible one. The indestructible one, so indestructible is one. Then the next one is inseparable. Inseparable. Both connotations are there. And the um, say, the, um, let's say that our mind, nothing can destroy a mind. Nothing can make a mind disappear. So in a way, a mind is indestructible. But the human form today, the human form, that is can, that can be destroyed. So now the, the thing is that it the, has a connotation of indestructible, inseparable. Inseparably indestructible. Okay, what is that? Um, say in the sutra system, we talk about the, we talk about, let's say that the, the body, speech and mind. Body, speech and mind. These three are seen as three distinct entities. In Tantra system, body, speech and mind, when you really become enlightened, these two can become the same nature, same entity. So they become inseparably indestructible. Then the other one is the, the we talk about the method and the wisdom. Method and wisdom. Um, in the sutra system, we practice wisdom separately, method separately, and these two will support each other in ways of two distinct entities. They support each other. For example, like say the say on the um, it is like the two wings of the, the the bird. The two wings are two separate entities, but the wing A helps wing B to fly. Wing B helps wing A to fly. So these two assist each other, help each other. These, these two work in unison, but these two are not same entity. These two are different entities. Whereas in Tantra system, um, the Vajra, the non-duality, inseparable, meaning the method and wisdom, they are seen to be conjoined within the same, same object in the form of same entity. In the form of same entity. Uh, the so this is the what the method and wisdom method and wisdom in one entity um say that the okay so this is one thing then the next is the the method and wisdom in terms of uh, say uh, the in terms of your body and the mind in sutra the body and the mind are to be seen as two distinct entities but in tantra particularly when we reach a sophisticated tantric practice where your body and the mind, these two become the same entity. For example, like we, we talk about the illusory body. When we talk about the illusory body, then the, the body and the mind, these two are actually, the illusory body itself is the manifestation of your mind, of your pure mind. That comes very uh, way later. Okay, so the, the Vajra here is that has that connotation. Vajra inseparable, indestructible. So these two combined together, these two are indestructible and inseparable. So homage to the glorious Vajrasattva. It has been stated, so this this verse, this verse coming from the Shri Guya Samacha Root Tantra, devoid of all substantive entities, utterly discarding all objects and subjects, such as aggregates, elements, and sense sources. Due to the sameness of selflessness of all phenomena, one's mind is primordial unborn. It's the nature of emptiness. Okay, let me quickly explain this. Um, devoid of all substantive entities, 
So the besides what your mind imputes, there's nothing really there as objectively as a substantial entity there. There's nothing really there. Everything is the nature of the emptiness. Utterly discarding all objects and subjects. What we see as subject and object, this is all because of the, the duality created by our misconception, influenced by the self-grasping ignorance, the chronic disease of self-grasping ignorance from time immemorial. Utterly discarding. So when you reach that state to see the reality in its bare form, then all the subject object duality dissolves. So what kind of the entities dissolve, such as aggregates, elements, and sensors? What do you mean by dissolve here? What do you mean by dissolve here? For example, let's say that I say one common example is that when we say from distance we look at the, the we we look at the forest amazon forest you see a, the say from just from the airplane you look at the amazon forest you see the forest there but you don't identify the individual trees whether it's oak tree or whether it's what the tim the, the what the, the same what tree that is we cannot identify it's just some um, like a uh, the bush, there's a forest there. Oh, it's a thick forest. From distance, you can see the forest. When you go into the forest, you see the individual trees. You will not see the forest. So the point is that um, they say the forest is something which you see from distance. And the individual trees, where the forest disappears, happens when you go into the forest. When you go closer to the forest, the forest disappears. So... In, the, in other words, what I'm saying is that all these, the, what we say is aggregates, elements, and sources. By the way, all of us, we need to remember that these three things, they come in a form of a package. In a package, in, is the, when the Buddha, when the Buddha uh, teaches, Buddha teaches oftentimes with these three things all coming together, be it, be it in the Professional Wisdom Sutra or in the Abhidhamma, the, the, the teachings, the Buddha brings these three things, most, most commonly these things always together. Five aggregates, referring to the five aggregates, five aggregates which constitute all the impermanent phenomena. And the elements, 18 elements, Five aggregates, the 18 elements. 18, 18 elements which constitute the whole, everything that exists in this universe. Everything, including permanent, impermanent, composite, non-composite. Everything is incorporated uh, within the 18 elements. Then the sources. So actually, uh, the, the, the better would be instead of sense sources, it should be sources. It should not be sense sources here in this context. Why? Uh, for the reason that the um, this this source here is the twelve sources. It's not only the sense source. Sense source means it's only six. It should be twelve. So say the five aggregates, then the twelve sources, and the eighteen elements. So it needs to be this transition needs to be fixed. I'm requesting all the Tibetan staff to to change this or. We can give a footnote to this because that this is translated by. Okay, um, the such as aggregates, elements, and sources. Because the why I'm saying this is that of course sense source is also there. Simply by without looking at the without looking at the Tibetan the the original source original text, I'm just confident saying this because that these three always comes together. They come together. They come together in the teachings of Buddha. So the the twelve sources, due to sameness of selflessness. Okay, what I'm saying is that when you say just as in the forest, when you go in, into the forest, the forest concept of forest dissolves. Likewise, likewise this flower. You see this is a flower. So you see this as a flower, and you enjoy this flower. Particular people who love flowers. You see this, you are very happy. When you go into the atomic level, we see that the concept of the flower dissolves. How many agree with me, hands? The moment you go into the atomic level, the concept of flower dissolves. Okay, so and the, this is the meaning of say, subjecting the objects to the ultimate reality, ultimate analysis. We see that the object makes no sense. 
talked to. Um, they such as aggregates, elements, the sources in the form of subject of duality dissolve in the concept of in the eyes of the ultimate analysis. Due to sameness on that level, what is really there, independent of our observation, independent of our uh, the mental perception, what is really there? This next question, what is really there? So what is really there? And this cannot be described as a flower, as a non-flower. Nothing can be described. So therefore, the ultimate reality is oftentimes described as indescribable phenomena. Indescribable phenomena. Cannot be described as flower, can be described as non-flower, can be described, described as both flower and non-flower, neither, no flower, non-flower. So this is known as the indescribable reality. Okay. So with this, uh, they do the sameness of selflessness of phenomena. When on the level of their selflessness, every phenomena just says shares the same nature of same nature. The sameness, sameness of the, the same taste, same nature of being devoid of objective reality to be seen as indescribable reality out there. One's mind is primordial unborn. And this being the reality, your mind. Well, your mind also is not only the object, object which is seen in the form of the indescribable, the uniform reality. Even this mind is also sharing the same nature. Whereas the Chittamatra school, Yogacara school, uh, talks about, yes, ex external realities, they're all like illusion. But the, your mind exists as truly. Now, Arindigarjuna, as uh, the by citing the, 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 the tantric source, one's mind is primordial unborn, primordial, since no beginning, since beginningless time, your mind is also unborn nature. Unborn meaning does not, does, does not have the, they say, objective or does not have independent the quality of production is unborn, unborn, objectively unborn. It is the nature of emptiness. Emptiness meaning objectively is empty. Okay. Um, just as the blessed one, that just as the blessed Buddhas and the great Bodhisattvas have generated the mind of great awakening. So finally, it is like being in a dream. And how many of us in our, in our dream, at least once in our lifetime, we had a nightmare, reasons? Nightmare. Okay. Snay, tell me, what do you mean by nightmare? Uh, something very, very unpleasant and scary. Very scary, unpleasant dream. Very good. Okay, can you give me some example? Anyone, anyone raise hands? Raise hands who like to share? Who likes to share uh, the undesirable, uh, very extremely scary, unpleasant dream? You like to share with us? Quick, quick, quick. Quick. Anyone raise hands? Okay. Robin Hart. Unmute. Yes. Um, a dream that I don't have any control in the dream. Like I what? Uh, things are happening that I cannot uh, get out of or, uh, you know, a place that I uh, am, am in that I don't want to be in. Okay. So the Robin wants to keep it very general. <laughs> Anybody who likes to be more precise? <laughs> uh, anyone who likes to be more, more precise? Very scary dream. Raise hands, raise hands. Okay, the Jeffrey La. Uh, yes, Geshe La. When I was taking care of Kensar Rinpoche, I had a dream that he was on a dialysis machine at night and couldn't be unhooked. And I had a dream that he unhooked himself and he was in a city somewhere else. And I literally woke up to run downstairs to see if he was hooked up to his machine. <laughs> it, it shook me that much. And I didn't have any control, and I thought, "Oh, suddenly something terrible has happened." And and uh, you, okay, <laughs> okay, but the, the, the Jeffrey Lab. The, okay, when I asked Jeffrey Lab, let us all be mentally be part of it. You imagine that I'm asking the question to you, each one of you. My question is, why should you be scared? It's just a dream. 
Rinpoche is, was still in your room. Is in your house. Why? Why were you scared? I didn't know I was. Okay, dreaming. all of you, just all of you, all of you think. You know that I'm asking this question to you, and what is your response? Okay, Jeffrey La. I had the ignorance that I didn't know I was dreaming. I thought that the dream was real. I thought the dream was real. Okay, how many agree with Jeffrey La resents? Good. Okay, so we see them as real, and then the uh, so. So that city where you found Rinpoche in the dream, right? Very different city. So that city, did it have many cars? Many buildings? Buildings. He was going up some steps. I was coming out of a door like, yes, what steps, are you here? Steps. Yes, it's steps. Many steps. I don't even know. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So when, what happened to these steps? When I woke up, they were gone. Yeah. They were gone. All the city is gone. The city with all the buildings, and all the cars, people, everything gone, right? Not that they're, they, 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 the people at the steps, they dissolve into like water. No, simply they're gone. The moment you discover them, you see them, they're gone. Because you, in the dream, you see them as real, not as a dream, not as subjective. You see them as objectively real. The moment you wake up, you see them as the subject real, then objectively, your mind st stops projecting them. Okay. So with this in mind, they um, say the, the Buddhas, they are known as the fully awakened one. So as long as we're in the dream, we're being affected by the dream. And then the, there's no freedom. As Jeffrey has said, it's all, all of the ignorance that we believe the dream is real. So therefore, the dream affects us. And it can be very scary. It can be nightmarish. So, are they, um, who are those people? Who, and we want to be freed from these problems. The problem of the, the nightmare. For that, what should we do? We have to wake up. It's, it's for this reason that the Buddha is re referred to as the fully awakened one. And anybody who wants to go in this direction, they are looking for the awakening mind. We need to build the awakening mind to be awakened fully at one point. So the text reads, Just as the blessed Buddha and the great Bodhisattvas have generated the mind of great awakening, full awakening, I too shall from now on, from now, until I arrive at the heart of awakening. Heart of awakening meaning full awakened state. Generate the awakening mind in order that I may save those who are not saved. Okay, so this has several interpretations. So one interpretation is that I may save those who are not saved, referring to the same that I mean that I be able to save the beings from taking birth from taking birth into the lower realms. And free those who are not free. And the free those who are not in the lower realms who are in the high realm, but still in samsara, free those from samsara to nirvana. Free those from samsara. Relieve those who are not relieved. Meaning that those who are already freed from samsara, they be relieved to the state of full awakening. Buddhahood. Why? Say the, uh, by the Buddha, with the Bodhicitta. Then, uh, relieve those who are not relieved and help thoroughly transcend sorrow. That the say the to transcend sorrow, there are two ways of doing it. One is by sutra system, and the other one the tantra system. So, the employing the tantra system, it they clears away the mental defilements completely. So, I said that the not only that the person be able to embrace full enlightenment on the basis of the sutra system, but also on the basis of the the tantra system to activate the subtleness of the mind which otherwise which otherwise is totally out of our control but to control them use them to see the ultimate reality and free all the mental deformments so uh, the point is that without these this the system that even if you are able to see emptiness directly the moment your mind slips into the subtle level of the mind you don't have the control so therefore you cannot use this subtle mind and if you cannot use the subtle mind to see emptiness, then the subtle mind can again continue to play trick on us, continue to 
the let's say make you believe in things as object real, make you see things as object real because you don't have control. So with the tantric system, it helps us to uh, train to manifest this subtle mind under your control and then employ this to see the ultimate reality. So the, all the misconceptions, be it on the gross level, waking state, or be it on the, the subtlest level, all are under your control. This is a full awakening, thoroughly transcend sorrow. Those who have not thoroughly transcended sorrow, those bodhisattvas, who practice by means of the sixth mantra, sixth mantra, after having generated the awakened mind in terms of its conventional aspect in the form of aspiration, must then produce the ultimate awakened mind through the force of meditative practice. So here, bodhicitta, awakened mind, um, the in Sanskrit is the bodhicitta in Tibetan Changjusim. So this awakened mind is of two kinds. Uh, one is the conventional bodhicitta, and the other one is ultimate bodhicitta. So it's it reads here that those bodhisattvas who practice by means of the sacred mantra after having generated the awakened mind in terms of its conventional aspect in the form of aspiration, meaning that may I become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. That's aspiration. May I become. So technically, this is known as the conventional bodhicitta or what you call as bodhicitta. So when you talk about the bodhicitta, wisdom of emptiness, so that bodhicitta, as opposed to the wisdom of emptiness, that is known as the conventional bodhicitta, the aspiration to become Buddha for the benefit of sentient beings, which has the conventional reality as is the object. Then the with this bodhicitta, then we have to go to actually cleanse the mental departments. The bodhicitta, may I become Buddha for the benefit of sentient beings. But how to become Buddha? By removing the mental dirt. You don't the Buddha, we cannot get it from outside. The Buddha himself very clearly taught. And further, the, the Acharya Nagabodhi, a disciple of the Arinagarjuna, what he said is that the Buddhahood is not bestowed upon you by anyone. English translation, the Buddhahood is not, a, not bestowed upon you by anyone, nor is the cause of the Buddhahood held by anyone for you. It is only through you discovering the Buddha nature within that you become Buddha. So uh, they say we have to, uh, the, the Buddhahood should be sought. May When you say, may I become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings, that is when you're a Bodhisattva. Bodhi is a full awakening and Sattva is the courageous one. Courageous one who dares to, who dares to seek Buddhahood, full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. It requires immense courage. So that is known as a Bodhisattva. So for them, and the, the motivation is the conventional bodhicitta. With the conventional bodhicitta motivation, which is the, in the form of aspiration to become Buddha, you have to actually do something to become Buddha. What should you do? You have to, to resort to the means to cleanse the, cleanse the mental defilements so that the Buddha, Buddhahood inside will manifest. So what is that remedy? What is that means to help remove the mental defilements? That is the Ultimate bodhicitta. What is ultimate bodhicitta? Ultimate bodhicitta is the non-dual wisdom of emptiness of the Arya bodhisattvas. Let me repeat it. What is ultimate bodhicitta? Of course, for us, we are, ultimate bodhicitta to attain Buddhahood is the Arya, the non-dual wisdom of emptiness of the Arya bodhisattvas. Okay, so uh, the those those beings who generated who generate the conventional bodhicitta with aspiration, may I become Buddha for the benefit of sentient beings? You have to do something to become Buddha. You have to do something. What should you do? You have to do to remove the mental dirt so that the Buddhahood inside will be unveiled. So how to remove the mental dirt? But it's sort to a very powerful remedy. What is that remedy? That remedy is the ultimate bodhicitta, the non-dual wisdom of emptiness of the Arya Bodhisattva. So it says that the, those Bodhisattvas who practice by means of the sixth mantra after having generated the awakened mind in terms of conventional aspect in the form of an aspiration, then that Bodhisattva must then produce the ultimate awakened mind 
ultimate awakened mind is bodhicitta, ultimate bodhicitta, which is the non-dual wisdom of the emptiness of the Arya Bodhisattvas through the force of meditative practice. Of course, um, to reach to that level of non-dual wisdom emptiness, it must be preceded by the the dualistic experience of the emptiness, which in turn must be preceded by the of uh, the wisdom of reflection on the emptiness, which in turn must be preceded by the reflection of the wisdom of the studies of the emptiness. In other words, studies, reflection, and meditation, they must go hand in hand in a proper sequence. Initially, vast studies, wisdom drive through studies, followed by wisdom drive through reflection, followed by wisdom drive through meditation. So within that, then there are two levels, wisdom drive through the the meditation meditative wisdom wisdom of meditation of emptiness on the conceptual level and on the non conceptual level there too so the are the uh, the ultimate bodhicitta is the on the non conventional level in order to reach that first you have to go through the conventional level so first you have to go through the conventional level for example in order to become a phd in english the the um, linguistics. First, you have there's no way other than to learn A for apple, B for ball. You have to learn this. And some people they say that no, so we have a direct shortcut, cutting through, cutting through, and so forth. This is all just you know. Yes, you can do that. First, you have to you have to for A for apple, then go into the complicated Shakespeare in English, not directly Shakespeare in English. So people advertising that we give only the Shakespeare in English, even without A for Apple, we can do that. And people come and then they end up in dismay. Okay, so these are the illusions created by some people. So we should be very careful um, not to deceive ourselves. Okay, so I shall therefore explain its nature. Now this is the Arendigarjuna's commentary. Bowing to the glorious Vajra holder, Vajra holder meaning Vajra, as I said earlier, the non duality, the Vajra holder meaning uh, the practitioners, practitioners who perfected in the, the, in the assuming the, the non dual, the non duality of the body and the mind, non duality of the, uh, the non duality, of, non duality of the body and the mind, or the illusory body and the clearer mind. Um, who embodies the awakening mind. So Vajra Holder refers to all the Buddhas, all the Buddhas, who embodies the awakening mind, who embodies this, uh, the awakening bodhicitta. I shall explain here the meditative practice of awakening mind that destroys cyclic existence. So awakening mind here, which Arad Nigarjun is going to explain, is it encompasses both the conventional bodhicitta and the ultimate bodhicitta, both in order to destroy the cyclic existence. Verse number two, the Buddha maintained, the Buddha's maintained the awakened mind to be not obscured by such conceptions as consciousness of self, aggregate, and so on. It is always characterized by emptiness. So this awakened mind, uh, they say, finally, what, what, the, what should we do? What should we do to attain a goal? The goal, the most meaningful goal is to remove the metal dirt. That is the most meaningful goal. And for this matter, and the, the, what will be done is by resort to the wisdom of emptiness. And what is bodhicitta? Conventional bodhicitta. Conventional bodhicitta is the, the driving force to make this ultimate bodhicitta to work. It is like very sharp X, which is like the ultimate bodhicitta. And what is the conventional bodhicitta? It is like the, a very into the person who is extremely enthusiastic, very strong, physically strong person who is very enthusiastic to cut the poisonous tree by using the eggs. But it's a person so weak, physically weak, the mentally so weak, that a person cannot, even the even if the eggs are so sharp, he cannot use it to cut the, the huge chronic disease like the poisonous tree. It's impossible. So therefore it requires a very strong enthusiasm and very strong the physical strength. So that is bodhicitta. So um, the, the, the point is to, Eradicate the self-grasping ignorance, afflictive obscurations, 
at a corner of obscurations to eradicate that. Uh, finally, what eradicates these is the wisdom of emptiness. So, what is emptiness? The, Buddha, the Buddhas maintain the awakened mind to be of not obscured by such conceptions. Say, may I become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings? Yet, if my mind is the may I become a objectively existent Buddha for the benefit of all the objective existent sentient beings, then it becomes, it will never happen. Because that you believe in objective existence, that blurs you or that veils you from attaining Buddhahood. So that bodhicitta must be cleared of the misconceptions of the seeing things as object real. And to be not obscured by such, such conceptions as consciousness of objective self, consciousness of objective aggregates and so on, is always characterized by emptiness of objectivity, emptiness of objective existence. It is with a mind moistened by compassion that you must cultivate a waking mind with effort. So, uh, so this is with respect to the conventional bodhicitta. And the conventional bodhicitta, to, to what extent your bodhicitta uh, the, is strong or weak, is determined by the the degree of the uh, the degree of the strength of your compassion. So, therefore, the Buddha's teaching is grounded on compassion. Buddha for Buddha, compassion is the, the basic fabric of the Buddha's teachings. So uh, the if you look at the, the two methods to regenerate bodhicitta, the sevenfold are uh, the method to regenerate bodhicitta, the sevenfold course in effect means to practice bodhicitta, and the, the method of equalizing and exchanging self for others to regenerate bodhicitta for the two methods, we see that the compassion is there. The main aim is to build the compassion. Once you build the compassion, then the, the next is, okay, I want all beings to be freed from suffering. So how to make it happen? Who will do that? I will do it. How you will do it? By becoming Buddha. So compassion, that is the key. So it says here that it is with the mind moistened by compassion that you must cultivate a waking mind with effort. With effort meaning the sevenfold cost effect method to regenerate bodhicitta and the method of equalizing and exchange of others. But to study these uh, separately. We have to study separately. And of course, there are really good books there. His Holiness, the Dalai book, for example, like I like the, uh, the what is that? How to Practice. How to Practice. It has many uh, teachings on the, uh, the, the, the methods to regenerate bodhicitta. And um, the likewise, my own teacher, Venerable Geshe, Lopsang Yazurambuchi, his book, the title is Bodhicitta. Uh, this is also available. Uh, this, and he really embodied as a Bodhisattva. And I personally would say that in, the, in my life as a student, his student, and the two times, I had an extremely strong feeling within me that he was a Bodhisattva. A very strong feeling came to me twice. He's really a bodhisattva. Okay, so the and his so because of this, what he wrote on bodhicitta makes total sense. Some people they write on emptiness and they don't practice emptiness at all. They write on emptiness, and they hold everything and they book say, oh, I book on this emptiness, that emptiness, so forth, and then they don't don't believe in emptiness themselves. They believe in something else, you know. What they practice something different, nothing to do with the emptiness. And one day I asked one the, 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 the person, I'm not going to mention the person. I told the person that okay, now it is time for us to actually practice the wisdom of emptiness. And the person said that, no, I I have my personal practice. I remember. And the person actually, actually, yeah, the person, you know, he comes to be known to the, the community through his book on emptiness. But he doesn't believe in this. He doesn't study, he doesn't practice the emptiness at all. And he, he says, oh, I have, yeah, I have my present practice. And I know what that practice is. It's just a single point of meditation. And he feels calm, quiet. He shares some of his experiences. It's very sad. So when these people write books on emptiness and people take it very seriously, it can be very misleading because that person will have no experience of emptiness, simply intellectual exercise. And then if you follow these books, it can be very dangerous. 
So therefore, the point is that when we read books, the books must be actually authored by the the the, the people scholars who actually believe in the wisdom of emptiness and who actually practice wisdom of emptiness and who who have high regard, high sense of value, such reverence to the wisdom of emptiness. If you read these books, like Lama Tsongkhapa's books, uh, they, luckily we have both the, almost like, I would say the, uh, like the commentary on Arendigarjuna's text, Ocean Reasoning by Lama Tsongkhapa that's available in English is a good translation. And then the, the one the commentary on Acharya Charikri, this the, the text and to the middle way um, translated by uh, this amazing translation. And then the 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 great treatise on the stage of the part of the Enlightenment, the third volume, again on emptiness, so well translated. I really appreciate it. So these three are there, and then there are some others I know, but the uh, I'm not I'm not too sure about the the translation because I didn't really go through those translations. But these three I went, I went through these translations. They're very good. Okay, so what I'm saying is that, particularly with respect to emptiness, we have to read the books which are really, really, really reliable. Not just that it's a book on emptiness doesn't mean that it, it doesn't mean anything. Whereas for Bodhicitta, don't worry. Bodhicitta, you can you can easily be a good judge because you can read the books on Bodhicitta and uh, the, you can feel it because the concept-wise, they are not difficult. Only things of feelings. So with the Bodhicitta, you could, okay, this is it's more like simply repeating somebody what somebody said it and it doesn't really have the feelings. Then you will just drop it. For example, like Lama Tsongkhapa's second volume. Second volume, the, the beginners, if you read the second volume, which is on Bodhicitta, if you read this, you may think that, you may not think that it is dry. You may think that it's too technical. But when you practice Bodhicitta, when you get stuck after practicing, then you read the second volume, you will see that this is the book which saves me. Okay, so this says how we should learn to appreciate the various books. Okay. So now we will read the next passage and then we'll stop here. Okay. It is number three. It is with the mind moistened by compassion that you must cultivate awaken a mind or bodhicitta with effort by depending on these two, two methods. These two methods must be, we have to practice these two methods. Only then you see that your compassion actually grows and it's very different from how you describe somebody else. Oh, this person very kind, compassionate person versus the feeling somebody feels when the person practices bodhicitta. That too, when succeeds to some extent, the, the feeling expands and versus somebody who is naturally kind, these were very different. And when the, if natural kind, because of practice bodhicitta in the former life, that's same. But there are some people who are natural kind, but not due to the practice of bodhicitta. Okay. The Buddhas who embody great compassion constantly develop this awakened mind. So in a way, these are all the uh, say advice for us by Arendigarjuna, that this is what the Buddhas, how the Buddhas they succeeded to awaken the Buddha nature. It's because of practice, constant practice of bodhicitta, a great compassion. As such, we, if we really want to become enlightened, to attain uh, the, the fearlessness and infinite happiness, uh, this is what we should be doing. Number four, the self postulated by the extremists. Extremists meaning those who believe in the some objectified self, objectified the, the self, self that's so well-defined, objective, objectified, well-defined, solid self, independent of a mind. Um, the uh, people who believe in these concepts, they are known as extremists. For example, many non-Buddhist traditions in the past, and also within Buddhism, we see that Vaibhashika, Sautrantika, Chittamatra, Svatantra, Matimika, they all believe in some degree of the objectified self. The self postulated by the extremists, when you thoroughly analyze it with reasoning, within all the aggregates of the body and the mind, nowhere can you find a locus for it. 
If the self does exist to object real, some way you'll be able to see it through ultimate analysis. So what is ultimate analysis? Uh, this we will uh, learn in the next class tomorrow. What is ultimate analysis? With this, then the following verses will make more sense for us. Okay, we'll stop here. Should we recite some dedication prayers? Yes. Yes, please. <clears throat> In the land circled, encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezik, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. Just as the brave Manjush Mantabhadra to realize things as they are, also I dedicate all these merits in the best way that I may follow their perfect example. I dedicate all these roots of virtue with the dedication praise as the best by all the Buddhas who appeared in the three times so that I might perform the noble Bodhisattva's deeds. May the supreme Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase forevermore. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. I dedicate the merit thus gathered towards a realization of the deeds and the prayers of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the three times and to the upholding of the Dharma of teaching and realization. May I in all lives through the force of this merit never separate from the four wheels of the Mahayana vehicle and accomplish all the stages of the path, renunciation, bodhicitta, perfect view, and the two stages. May sentient beings again and again make offerings to all the Buddhas and may they constantly be joyful with the inconceivable bliss of the Buddhas. With the wish to free all sentient beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha Dharma and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all sentient beings without exception into that enlightened state. Thank you so much, Geshe-la, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a good rest and good night. And for those of you who don't know, geshe is in Delhi and it's probably past 10 p.m. for him now. So he won't be in bed till probably okay. like 11. Okay. okay, see you tomorrow. Thank you, Geshe-la. Thank you, everyone. See you all you. tomorrow morning, Art New York time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Geshe-la. Thank you, Sinead. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Geshe-la. Thank you, Shanti Davis Center. Thank you, Geshe-la. Thank you, Geshe-la. Thank you, Geshe-la.